This is a pre-recorded presentation, so the presenter will not be taking any questions. However, all questions asked during the live presentation, along with answers, are included at the end of this presentation. To learn more about our upcoming patient and family conferences in your area, please visit aamds.org slash conferences. To view other recorded presentations or to register for other live online learning events, please visit aamds.org slash learn. Welcome to our live webinar titled, What are Mutations? Learning about Genetics. Thank you for joining us. My name is Angie Onerfrey, Director of Patient Education at AMDSIS, and I'll be moderating the presentation today. As we get started, I would like to thank Celgene and Takeda for providing educational grants and the generous support of our patients, families, and caregivers in providing support for this webinar program. Today's presenter is Dr. Mir Fathi, who is the Director of the Leukemia Program at Massachusetts General Hospital. With that said, it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Fathi. Thank you so much uh, for the kind introduction, and uh, thank you also to the Foundation for uh, kindly and generously uh, inviting me to uh, speak uh, to the audience today uh, via this mechanism. Um, as a way of introduction, I, um, I, I'm a leukemia specialist uh, and a bone marrow malignancy specialist at uh, Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston. I specialize in myelodysplastic syndromes, myeloproliferative neoplasms, as well as acute leukemias. Um, I was tasked uh, today uh, to speak on um, the genetics and genomics and chromosomal alterations underlying many of the diseases that we treat. Uh, to speak about these in a, uh, hopefully a, an easy to follow manner, although uh, it can get quite complex if uh, you get in the weeds, um, and also uh, express some amount of um, optimism regarding um, where we are, what we've learned about the diseases that we're treating, and hopefully uh, that can translate over time and has already in some ways translated into better, more effective novel treatments uh, for these diseases. So with that said, I'd like to uh, get started uh, with uh, the presentation. So let's start with um, AML, acute myeloid leukemia. Generally speaking, there are two common forms of uh, acute leukemia, um, acute lymphoid leukemia and acute myeloid leukemia. Acute lymphoid leukemia is much more common in pediatric uh, cases. Um, and much more common in children, although adults can also get acute uh, lymphoid leukemia. Um, acute myeloid leukemia, however, is seen mostly among adults. Um, uh, the median age is 67. Therefore, um, about half the patients at diagnosis are in their 70s and 80s and a half or younger. Does not mean that you cannot get AML when you're, in, you know, in your 20s or 30s or even younger as a, as a child. You can, but generally speaking, the median age of AML is sick in the uh, high 60s. New cases each year of AML is about 21,000, and they uh, increase uh, every year, um, likely resulting from uh, the aging population in the United States. AML is a relatively uncommon disease as compared to breast cancer or colon cancer, which have an incidence that ranges into the hundreds of thousands per year. Uh, AML is approximately a log less, and that, in my opinion, is a, is a good thing. However, we have not uh, done sufficiently well, in my view, in the last few decades in order to cure the majority of our patients. Uh, most of our patients, for a variety of reasons, either do not respond to treatment, relapse following initial treatment, or are not eligible for available therapies. And as a result, deaths are common uh, following a diagnosis of acute leukemia. So just to provide some degree of context regarding how um, AML can arise, um, I'm providing a, a bit of a cartoon, a schema here that I've borrowed from one of my mentors at uh, Johns Hopkins. Generally speaking, within our bones, within our thoracic bones, our pelvic bones, the long bones, is a cavity called the marrow. And in this marrow resides a pool of nutritious substance. And in this pool, 
uh, what we see in front of you occurs, which is the normal hematopoietic maturation process, where uh, the hematopoietic stem cell, which is the stem cell committed to forming blood cells, ultimately resides, multiplies slowly, and over time matures slowly in stepwise fashion, as you see here, into more and more mature forms, ultimately becoming fully mature red cells, white cells, or platelets. When it's fully mature, uh, a blood cell, whether it's a red cell, white cell, or platelet, escapes uh, the marrow through small vessels and starts to circulate in the blood. And in the blood, I'm sure as many in the audience know, um, each type of cell has its own characteristic um, uh, uh, function. Red cells help to uh, carry uh, oxygen. White cells have a variety of functions, but Roughly speaking, um, they help to uh, fight infection and mediate inflammation and do uh, many other things. And platelets uh, are an initial step in clotting the blood. So all types of blood cell components uh, serve very important functions. As cells mature in this pyramidal fashion in the marrow, they live uh, uh, by degree shorter and shorter lifespans so that a fully mature uh, red cell, white cell, or platelet lives days to weeks in the blood and dies a natural death. That's the, this, what you see in front of you, roughly speaking, is the hematopoietic maturation process and system um, whereby stem cells in the marrow slowly over time mature to produce the cells that we need to function in terms of uh, hematopoiesis. How does malignancy then arise in the bone marrow? Well, uh, in terms of acute leukemia, a series of alterations has to take place. And, and this lightning bolt that you see here is roughly uh, what I'm describing as a series of mutations. Now, it's not just one lightning bolt. It's probably several. You need some alterations that tell these early cells don't mature normally. And then you probably need another uh, or a series of alterations that tell these now immature cells that are stuck being immature to then multiply as immature cells rather than becoming in stepwise fashion more mature. So when these alterations then take place, you form aberrant cells that multiply quickly and do not mature normally. And these aberrant cells slowly over time take over the marrow compartment and interfere with the normal hematopoietic process of maturation. And this picture is actually looks it's very reminiscent of what we see under the microscope when we look at a marrow from a patient with acute leukemia. See a lot of immature, large cells that do not have the normal functioning of blood cell components. Okay. And as you can imagine, this problem here is very difficult to surmount because this type of situation causes um, bone marrow failure. Patients are not able to, because their marrow is uh, taken up by uh, abnormal leukemic cells, they're not able to produce the normal cells. So patients oftentimes come in with very low levels of healthy white cells, red cells, and platelets. So folks oftentimes ask me, how does a patient with AML present? I think in the lay public, acute leukemia sometimes seems, appears to be a patient coming in with a very high white count. Um, that is sometimes the case when these ugly cells escape the marrow and start circulating in the blood. But in most situations, patients present with low white cell count because the marrow is packed with these cells and the normal cells don't get out. So patients come in with low white cells, low red cells, and low circulating platelets. And as a result, respectively, they come in with infections because they don't have the white cells to fight them off. They come in short of breath or tired or fatigued because they have low amount of red cells and low oxygen carrying capacity. Um, they may come in with bleeding or with bruising um, as a result of low platelets because they're not clotting effectively. So the symptomatic presentation of AML arises from what happens in the marrow as the marrow is taken over by abnormal malignant cells, leukemic cells in particular. So what is the general approach in terms of treating uh, leukemia? Well, the general approach, unfortunately, uh, at least until 
very recently, had not changed for decades. In the late 1960s and early 1970s, a series of uh, laboratory-based and clinical studies looked at two groups of chemotherapy drugs, a chemotherapy called cytarabine and another class of chemotherapeutics called anthracyclines. Now, anthracyclines are, there are several of them, donorubicin, doxorubicin, idorubicin. Suffice it to say that donorubicin and idorubicin either uh, were com combined with cytarabine, and this combination uh, given to patients with acute leukemia, which you see in front of us, uh, led to a reduction over a period of days to weeks of the leukemic burden in the marrow, meaning it reduced the amount of these abnormal cells in the marrow, therefore allowing the time and space for the normal hematopoiesis that was there before leukemia came to resume. So it allowed for the normal resumption of hematopoiesis so that patients could again get white cells, again get red cells, and again get platelets, and their peripheral blood starts to look normal again. This here is called a remission. And still to this day, many of our patients are treated this way when they're newly diagnosed with acute myeloid leukemia. Patients come in with the disease. We give them a combination of either idorubicin, donorubicin, and cytarabine. And after about four weeks in the hospital, their blood counts recover. About 70% at least do. Some are resistant to treatment but their blood counts recover and their marrow has very low blast burden or very low leukemic burden. This is this picture that you see in front of you, roughly speaking, in cartoon fashion. So remission does not mean cure. As you can see, those ugly blue cells are still very much there, but they're suppressed as a result of chemotherapy to the point that you have normal hematopoiesis and you've bought yourself the time and space to go on and receive additional treatment, possibly a bone marrow transplant in an effort to cure you of your disease. But the goal of initial treatment for acute myelite leukemia has always been to try and achieve remission, which is what this is. But remission does not equate to cure. So let's take a step back and step away from the cartoon and actually look at what we generally see in the uh, underneath the microscope when we look at a sample from a patient's bone marrow. On the left, you see what should be the case, which is a normal, healthy appearing bone marrow aspirate. Now, if you take a look even from a distance, you see that there are many different types of cells there in the marrow, right? Because cells are going undergoing uh, maturation and differentiation in a normal, healthy process. And as they change and mature, they look differently underneath the microscope, okay? so. A normal, healthy marrow should look like almost like a garden of different shapes and flowers and different looking cells there um, because they're all different. They're all at different phases of maturation. On the right, you see a, a marrow sample that has acute myeloid leukemia. As you can see, there isn't that heterogeneity there anymore. It, it's just all very similar looking big cells with big nucleus in the middle of those cells. These are large, highly immature cells that have failed to mature any further and are stuck at this very early stage, okay? So you see this monoformic and unchanged looking cell population underneath the microscope. You should not be surprised that a patient with an AML cannot produce healthy blood components because their marrow is packed with these ugly cells. This here is the phenotype of acute myeloid leukemia. And actually, acute lymphoid leukemia, the other variant of acute leukemia seen more commonly in children, is a similar type of disease. It's just that the early cell is a lymphoid cell as opposed to a myeloid cell. Okay. So I was tasked today to try and speak a little bit about what underlies uh, AML. Okay. So um, before I get to that, however, I think it's probably a good use of our time uh, to speak about um, genes, DNA, chromosomes, just so we know uh, what we are uh, speaking on. So, um, and, I, and I suspect the, pop, uh, the audience here has a, probably a variable range of um, uh, 
scientific background or uh, genetic background. So I just want to keep this as uh, as uh, clear as I possibly can. But suffice it to say, as humans, we all of us have uh, 23 pairs of chromosomes, and our chromosomes come in different shapes and sizes, but they are all made of uh, DNA, right? Uh, tightly wrapped around proteins, and DNA is a type of acid, and it has different base pairs, either um, T, A, or G, C. So uh, thiamine, adenosine, guanine, cytosine, they are, uh, they uh, clip together and form different combinations, and these combinations form genes, which then lead to the production of proteins, which functionally tell the cell what to do at a molecular level. So these are codes within this double helix that then basically program what our cellular system ultimately does. Okay, so, and this DNA um, that is coding for genes, which are then subsets of different DNAs at different combinations of base pairs, then get tightly wound up around proteins and form the structure of individual chromosomes. Okay, so, and humans have 23 pairs of chromosomes. Now, um, most individuals have 23 healthy pairs of chromosomes. They have sex chromosomes, either XX or XY. Um, there are certain congenital conditions, such as Down syndrome, where you might have uh, abnormalities, right? So trisomy 21, for example, you would have three, 21, three chromosome 21s, for example, instead of two. And that is the case in every uh, one of the cells in that person's body. So that is an abnormality that it is not exclusive to any uh, particular cellular group or organ. It's all the cells of the body in patients who have congenital or genetic abnormalities that are inherited. inherited. When we talk about the abnormalities uh, or genetic, for example, mutations or chromosomal changes in malignancies, for example, acute myeloid leukemia, we're talking about the abnormalities within the malignant cells. These are mutations that arise in the genes or uh, abnormalities within the chromosomes that have arisen during the lifetime, lifetime of a patient that have led to the development of the leukemia. For example, in the DNA, um, if, there are an ab if there is an atypical or an abnormal base pair than how it should be, uh, the gene may not function or may be turned off or maybe it's hyperfunctioning. That's a mutation. That may tell a cell, for example, to stop maturing or may tell, may tell the cell to multiply uncontrollably. That's a genetic mutation that predisposes to a certain malignancy. So a mutation can occur within a gene and, a and an alteration can also occur within the larger chromosome itself, for example. Part of the chromosome, either the P arm or the Q arm, may be cut off. There might that's called a deletion, or part of a chromosome may s slip off one chromosome and go and attach itself to another chromosome. That's called a translocation. As you can imagine, these big global shifts in chromosomes also change the underlying code, right? Because the chromosomes are made of DNA and genes. So if part of a chromosome breaks off and goes and attaches itself to another part of another chromosome, you can form genes that are abnormal because they're attaching themselves to another part of a gene that they shouldn't be attaching themselves to. And if that new gene, that new uh, altered gene is one that, again, gives faulty signaling or silenced signaling, it may too lead to malignant transformation. So when we talk about molecular abnormalities in terms of those underlying disease, one thing to consider is that these abnormalities reside within the malignant cells, not all the cells of the body, but within the malignant cells, and they arose at some point during the lifetime of that patient around the time they probably developed that malignancy, usually in the case of AML in advanced age. Okay, So that, that could arise because there is a specific mutation or alteration of base pairs within the DNA at a very low level. Or it could be a global alteration within the chromosome itself, meaning part of the chromosome moves to another chromosome, or there is a deletion or alteration of the chromosome that is global, okay? And these alterations can be picked up by molecular testing techniques. 
you could do chromosomal analysis called uh, cytogenetic analysis, uh, or you could do mutational testing with PCR, which is another laboratory-based technique that looks at DNA alterations. So whether you do cytogenetic abnormality analysis or karyot also known as karyotypic analysis, um, or whether you do PCR analysis to look for specific mutations, all of that information is highly useful in the initial diagnostic workup of malignancy, and in this case, AML. So let's say, for example, a patient comes in uh, with low blood counts and they have a few immature cells that circulate in the blood and they have an infection or a propensity to bleed and bruise, and I'm actually worried about the fact that this person may have acute myeloid leukemia or some other bone marrow malignancy. I do a bone marrow biopsy, which means I insert a needle into their posterior, posterior iliac crest bone and I pull out some of the marrow and I send it off to pathology for analysis. What does that mean? Well, the fluid I take out from the bone is the marrow aspirate. That fluid has within it all the cells that we have just been talking about. That gets put on a microscope slide, so it gets looked at underneath the microscope to see the image that we saw earlier. Or, and in addition, it gets sent for chromosomal analysis to look for global chromosomal changes within those cells. And it also gets sent for DNA mutational analysis or RNA mutational analysis, namely different types of PCR uh, testing to see if there are specific mutations in the key genes that might impact normal maturation or uncontrolled cell division. So all of these happen at the same time. We look at the cells underneath the microscope. We send the sample also for chromosomal larger uh, chromosomal analysis, and also we send a sample for mutational testing as well to see if there is any abnormalities within the genes that are known to impact AML, okay? So I provided that background just because a lot of what I'm going to talk about from now on is going to be in the realm of chromosomes and DNA and genes, and I thought it's important to sort of have an understanding of what we look at. What do I mean by chromosomal analysis, also known as cytogenetic analysis, also known as karyotypic analysis? Well, it's this. So this is a patient with acute myeloid leukemia, and this is a patient who has a known translocation of chromosomes 8 and chromosome 21. So as you can see, for example, let me see if I can get this to work. So in this patient, uh, a, uh, the leukemic cell has been sent to a chromosomal lab where they have splayed out to 23 pairs of chromosomes. Okay, this patient happens to be a female. She has two X chromosomes. As you can see, this is a normal looking chromosome eight. However, it's partner chromosome 8 has a piece missing, okay? That piece is unfortunately attached to chromosome 21. And this here, therefore, is called a translocation 821. Translocation 821 is a well-known abnormality seen in about 5 to 10 percent cases of acute myeloid leukemia, okay? So this is a way that we help characterize molecularly how a particular leukemia might look at a molecular level. Why is this important? Well, 821 translocated AML, although uncommon among all AMLs, for whatever reason is highly sensitive to chemotherapy, meaning a patient with 821 translocated AML given chemotherapy up front has a much higher likelihood of achieving remission with initial therapy and a much higher likelihood of being cured ultimately with treatment as opposed to other forms of leukemia. So it is essential to know whether a patient has a particular molecular signature that defines their course of therapy, okay? Because we might choose to go with a more aggressive route or a less aggressive route. Patients with 821 translocated AML, especially if they're younger, may not need a more aggressive approach such as bone marrow transplant because their disease is so sensitive to chemotherapy alone, okay? In fact, we can look at the chromosomes and based on the chromosomes say if they're good risk, intermediate risk, or poor risk. Some of the good risk abnormalities are listed here. I don't know if you guys need to memorize this, but this is what we look for. 15, 17, all the way at the top, characterizes a type of AML called acute promyelocytic leukemia, which also is very 
uh, uncommon but also highly curable because you can actually add something to chemotherapy called all trans retinoic acid, a vitamin derivative, and help cure the majority of these patients. Okay. You can also give a combination of all trans retinoic acid and arsenic uh, to these patients and cure a large proportion of their patients. And the signature of the disease comes from that chromosomal change 1517. Okay. Unfortunately, the list of chromosomal abnormalities that define poor risk AML is longer than the list that defines good risk AML. So we more often find abnormalities such as missing part of chromosome 7 or missing part of chromosome 5 or what we call complex abnormalities, meaning multiple different abnormalities at the same time. These are considered poor risk. The reason for that is because these patients do not respond as well to chemotherapy, and we try our best to cure these patients if we're lucky enough to get them into remission by doing a bone marrow transplant in the eligible patient. A large chunk of patients, however, have neither good risk or poor risk karyotypes, and we call those patients intermediate risk. I don't know how well this slide projects, but depending on the chromosomal changes that you see, in the leukemic cells, as well as the mutations. Now, mutations, as I said, are different than chromosomal changes. Mutations are the actual changes in the base pairs at the level of the DNA that make up the genes that make up the chromosomes. So you can actually have mutations that have a similar impact to larger chromosomal changes, meaning you can have a mutation that is good risk and a mutation that is poor risk. So you take the mutational data, you take the chromosomal data, and you develop these groups that are prognostic. For example, a favorable risk group may have an A21 translocation or a mutated MPM1 mutation, and an adverse risk at the bottom may have mutations or chromosomal changes that are considered poor risk. And there have been multiple efforts to develop these prognostic factors, and they actually pan out. Okay, So these are survival curves for patients at the top. The frame A and frame B are patients who are younger, and frame C and frame D are patients who are older. There is disease-free survival and overall survival. And as you can see, patients with favorable molecular signatures in general do much better, especially if they're younger. Patients who have adverse risk molecular abnormalities, whether they're chromosomal changes or mutations, do much worse. As you can see, that red line, adverse risk, shows a long-term survival that is quite poor. doesn't mean that we cannot cure a subset of patients, but we cure a much smaller subset of patients because they respond less well to the treatments that we have available. So this is historically the approach we've taken to analyze the molecular underpinnings of AML because the chromosomal changes and mutations can help define better risk and worse risk disease. However, I would say that in the last 10 years, what we know about the underpinnings of AML, apart from just the chromosomal changes and a handful of mutations, has gotten steadily more complex. So, Starting, I would say, in 2010, uh, there was a rash of mutations that were described in various leading journals in AML, and they have continued to uh, be discovered and talked about. Some of them have prognostic significance, meaning some of the newly discovered mutations have a bearing on how patients do. They either portend a poor prognosis or a good prognosis. Some mutations do not seem to have an impact on prognosis. Whether you have the mutation or not doesn't seem to impact how you do with treatment. So what does this mean? Well, because we know much more about the mutations and the molecular abnormalities underlying different cases of AML, we're able to uh, basically tease out each case of AML based on the mutations that we see, which makes it much more complex. So when I round, for example, I see patients on the inpatient leukemia service, I go room to room. At any one time, we have somewhere around 20-something patients. Each room that I enter may have a patient with AML, for example, and each patient has a different disease in reality because their leukemia has a different set of mutations or chromosomal changes. In fact, if you look here, each column, this here is perhaps this figure is a, a bit complex, but each column uh, of these 200 columns listed here 
is one patient. And each mark is a mutation for that one patient, right? So you can just see how every patient with AML has a different molecular signature, apart perhaps from the ones all the way at the left, which are um, the, uh, the good risk leukemia patients, the ones that have the 821 or 1517. They don't seem to have as many abnormalities. And probably that may explain why they respond to chemotherapy better than the rest of patients who have either intermediate risk or poor risk AML, okay? So this picture is just to demonstrate how complex AML is and what we thought, um, more, how much more complex than we thought it was. Um, and that uh, provides both challenge and opportunity. So again, um, uh, when we look at now, now on the left panel, you see a series of mutations, all right? So these, many of these have just been discovered in the last 10 to 12 years. And uh, the bar graphs demonstrate the percentage of AML, uh, the percentage of patients with AML that have these mutations. You see FLT3, NPM1, DNMT3A, and the ITH mutations being among the more common mutations, but there are several more. And each of these mutations appear to um, uh, code. These are mutated genes, right? So they're abnormal genes, and they still code for things, but they may code for abnormal proteins that then impact the normal cycling, the normal maturation process that is therefore leading to the phenotype of AML. So for example, FLT3, the most common form of mutation, is causes a protein to be formed at the surface of cells, at the top left of that figure on the left, that tells the cell to multiply and don't stop multiplying. So it, it causes a proliferation of abnormal cells. Another gene or a group of genes, IDH mutations, um, impact the way a cell matures, basically blocking the normal maturation and differentiation of cells, which we talked about as key for the development of AML. So there are many ways that specific gene mutations can impact both proliferation, causing uncontrolled proliferation, and maturation, basically interrupting maturation, causing the development of the phenotype, meaning the nature of the actual symptomatic presentation of AML. So we've talked about uh, acute myeloid leukemia. Now let's take a step to the side and talk about myelodysplastic syndromes. What are myelodysplastic syndromes? Well, myelodysplastic syndromes are pre-leukemic conditions. They're kind of a the phase prior to AML that impact the way a cell matures, meaning that there isn't, as of yet, a lot of proliferation of immature cells, but there is definitely a disrupted maturation process. And when there is a disrupted maturation process, you can actually look underneath the microscope and you can see the abnormal cells there. They are not, the marrow is not packed with them, but they are there. And myelodysplastic syndrome is not one disease. It's a range of different uh, diseases characterized by different mutations and chromosomal changes and features, but they are all lumped into one overlying classification called MDS, which stands for myelodysplastic syndromes, right? So there's many different types. Um, MDS is probably much more common than we think because I suspect there are patients out there which have low blood counts, but their blood counts are not that low that they cause them symptoms, so they're never brought to medical attention. But they may, if you do a bone marrow biopsy, you may find MDS. So I suspect we are under-diagnosing MDS. But as a result, I would say there is a wide range in terms of incidence. So you can see 10 to 100 per million, it may be higher among elderly patients as they age. And the bar graph to the right shows how there is such a high rise in MDS as you get into your 70s and 80s. Again, I would say it's a relatively uncommon condition, but one that increases uh, with age. There is this entity called secondary MDS, and it's close neighbor, secondary AML. So MDS is really a pre-leukemic condition. If you wait long enough for patients who have abnormal maturation, they'll pick up additional mutations that cause those abnormal immature cells to proliferate and become AML. That's called secondary AML. Secondary MDS usually arises as a result of some insult in the past. 
So if you've been exposed to radiation, if you've been exposed to alkylating therapy, such as chemotherapies, if you've been exposed to other environmental agents that may impact the way your genes divide or your chromosomes change or how mitosis takes place, cellular damage, mutational damage at, uh, at some point in the past, you may have mutations in certain parts of your genome which cause MDS and then AML to potentially arise. That's called secondary MDS as opposed to de novo MDS or AML, which, M which is MDS or AML that arises without prior insult. Since I showed you a picture of AML, I thought I'd also show you a picture of MDS. So here, you don't see the global monomorphic cells. These cells all look a little bit different from each other, but they are abnormal looking. The arrows there show cells with basically broken up nuclei. Nuclei should be all together, all condensed into one cohesive uh, nucleus. You don't see that. You see broken up nuclei, abnormal maturation, unhealthy looking marrow cells. So this is what we call atypical maturation, arrest of maturation, specifically in early myeloid cells. Because these cells are unstable, both at a morphologic level, means what we see underneath the microscope, but also underneath with the, with the mutation DNA and chromosomal uh, status, they're, they're highly unstable. They're much more likely to accrue additional mutations or chromosomal changes over time. And it's just a matter of time for most cases of MDS to become leukemic. So in summary, MDS is a clonal, meaning it basically is a malignant or pre-malignant process um, that leads to um, abnormal maturation. Patients can have a high number of cells in the marrow or a low number of cells, but almost always come with low blood counts because their marrows don't know how to produce healthy cells in, in the right uh, proportion and right rate. Um, and as a result, people can come in with a similar um, uh, manifestations as leukemia, namely infections and bleeding and shortness of breath. But there are many different types of MDS. And what is important is pretty much every case of MDS marches at its own pace toward AML. However, that march can be very, very, very slow or very, very, very fast. And what determines the pace of that march is the mutations and the chromosomal changes and the underlying features of that MDS. So when I hear somebody has a myelodysplastic syndrome, I need to know more. I need to know what the proportion of immature cells are in their marrow because that tells me how close they are to AML. I also need to know what type of chromosomal changes or mutations have been detected in their marrow cells because that tells me about the pace of their movement towards AML. It's almost as if you're in a car and you're driving towards a cliff, which is AML, but the pace of how fast that car drives is the molecular underpinning, meaning the mutations and the chromosomes, and the number of immature cells in the marrow is the distance between the car and the cliff. That's how I oftentimes describe where we are, because I sometimes follow patients with myelodysplastic syndrome in my clinic for decades because they have low-grade MDS meaning that their pace of their disease is so slow that the likelihood that it becomes leukemic in their lifetime may be very, very low. On the other hand, I have patients who have myelodysplastic syndromes with very high-risk molecular features in whom I worry that they're going to develop AML in the next few months, and I need to develop a more aggressive risk strategy. Because myelodysplastic syndromes range uh, in, in terms of uh, their severity as well as their classification, there have been multiple different classification systems that have been developed. Um, this here is not something that I think the audience obviously needs to memorize, but it's one of the major uh, classification systems developed by the World Health Organization, and it was developed in 2016. And basically what, we, what is looked at in terms of this classification is what is seen underneath the microscope in terms of how many, what proportion of cells within the marrow are immature, namely these are called blast cells and also um, how, what the degree of dysplasia is, meaning abnormal growth, meaning abnormal changes in the cells that are there. 
Based on these categories, patients can be diagnosed uh, with different types of MDS. The second from the bottom row is called RAEB. RAEB is a form of MDS which is very common among our patients. These are patients who have MDS with excess blasts. Blasts are the cells that define AML. In fact, if you have 20% or more blasts in your marrow, that is one of the major diagnostic criteria for acute myeloid leukemia. Patients who have increased blasts but do not quite make it to 20%, for example, have 15% or 10%, can be considered to be an MDS syndrome, and they're called refractory anemia with excess blasts. Anything over 5% is considered excess. Now, all normal patients have blasts. Blasts are immature cells. We all have immature cells because we all have cells that are in various stages of growth within our marrow. But if you have, over time, increasing proportion of blasts that start, start to increase over 5%, that suggests that blasts are not maturing at a normal rate. And as a result, they build up in proportion in the marrow. And once they reach the 10% mark, they're considered MDS-EB2. And once they increase beyond 20%, they're considered acute myeloid leukemia. And in this fashion, MDS and AML, in many ways, is a continuum of the same disease. Like AML, you can define MDS according to its signatures and uh, molecular underpinnings. So high-risk AML patients generally do much worse than low-risk AML patients. And the survival is oftentimes paired with the progression of MDS towards AML. So if you have low-risk MDS, as you can see at the top of the green column there, those patients generally pro progress to AML at a much lower rate over time, and their survival is also better. But also keep in mind, MDS is a disease of older patients. So if you're diagnosed in your 70s and 80s, the likelihood that you survive 20 years is probably lower. So many, the survival does not necessarily equate to AML transformation in patients with lower risk disease. There are also a variety of mutations, just like in AML, that have been described in MDS, and some actually overlap with AML. So mutations like TET, like IDH, like P53, these are seen in both MDS and AML. There are also mutations that are more commonly seen in MDS. These are all listed here, and it was recently published in a major journal called Blood. Um, among the list of mutations that were discovered in MDS. As you can see, it's a wide range of alterations that have been discovered in genes un uh, underlying MDS, um, but these are alterations that we frequently see. And sometimes these mutations can tell us whether patients do well or do poorly. So on the left panel, I'll just bring your attention to five of these mutations, the presence of these mutations define whether patients were high risk and whether they did better in terms of overall survival or did not. So the lack of the mutations in general um, led to improved outcomes. The presence led to worse outcomes. On top of that, you can actually look at bone marrow transplant. Now, bone marrow transplant, especially in younger or healthier patients with MDS who can tolerate bone marrow transplant, is the treatment of choice because myelodysplastic syndromes cannot be cured without a bone marrow transplant. In many ways, myelodysplastic syndrome is almost like a corruption of the soil of the marrow, meaning that in order to cure the patients, you have to remove that soil and replace it with somebody else's, hence the bone marrow transplant being the only curative paradigm in the treatment of MDS. Now, you may not need to go down the road of transplant. For example, if you have a patient with low-risk MDS or an older patient who's not eligible for transplant, you may not choose to go down the road of transplant. You may try and follow that patient and see how they do with just active treatment. But if you want to cure a patient with transplant because perhaps they're too high risk or because they have already, they're already progressing towards that line, which is that leukemic line, you have to go down the road of a bone marrow transplant and certain mutations portend significantly worse prognosis following transplantation. One of this is P53 mutations. So if you have a P53 mutations, the likelihood of success, that red line on the bottom there, is significantly lower than those patients who did not have a P53 mutation in their MDS prior to transplantation. This paper was published in the New England Journal. Now, 
this here is considered, I believe it's called a fish plot because it kind of looks like different fish. But um, it just goes to tell you that AML is not only complex across a population of patients, it's also highly complex in one individual, right? So there are many different mutations that can underlie MDS or AML, but these mutations can change over time. So all the way at the left, you see what we generally think of as a malignancy, which are all these green cells with one mutation that is defining that MDS, let's say, okay? Over time, these cells being highly unstable and atypical pick up additional mutations that may lend them a survival advantage. It's evolution, it's like natural selection. And that mutation, for example, you see that little yellow mutation in that second column there, that leads to expansion of a clone at the expense of the other clone that was there before it, and that becomes the predominant abnormality. Doesn't mean that the earlier cell with the one mutation goes away, it persists, but at a lower level. And over time, you may pick up a third mutation that lends even a greater survival advantage, and now you have three different clones with different you know, survival uh, propensity and proliferative capacity. So that by the time we see a patient who has acute myeloid leukemia, they may have three different clones that have arisen from an initial clone. So when we talk to each other about cancer and malignancy basically being proliferation of the same ugly cell, that is not exactly the case. It's basically proliferation and clonal evolution of multiple ugly clones that arose from an initial ugly clone. Okay, and that's what makes treatment of malignancy and AML in particular difficult because you may give chemotherapy to the patient on the right and that chemotherapy may wipe away two of those clones, but one of them may be more resistant and may survive. And that clone then changes over time and becomes much more heterogeneous and resistant. So the heterogeneity of MDS and AML is not only across a patient population, meaning each patient we see has a different disease, it's in one patient oftentimes, especially if they have a long course of treatment and a long course of history and their disease has been exposed to different environmental pressures and natural selection pressures. So since uh, the name of the foundation here uh, is uh, incorporates aplastic anemia, I thought I would also briefly talk about aplastic anemia, although it is not a disease that I commonly treat. It does have some overlap in some cases with myelodysplastic syndromes, okay? So not all patients with aplastic anemia have MDS or develop MDS, but some do. And, and there are many theories about why that may be the case. Um, the underlying disease process of aplastic anemia is thought to be an immune-mediated destruction of certain types of cells. It's thought to be a T-cell destruction of certain types of cells leading to a low cellularity in the bone marrow and decreased production within the bone marrow. So as opposed to malignant proliferation or abnormal maturation, aplastic anemia appears to be basically an immune-mediated, autoimmune-mediated destruction of cells in the marrow leading to low blood counts. But if you have uh, this autoimmune, uh, immune-mediated bone marrow destruction over time, you too can have selective pressures on whatever is left over time. And rapid expansion over time when you actually treat these patients, leading to evolution and mutational changes that may arise over time. And patients can actually, some of them can develop chromosomal changes and mutational abnormalities that may render them then afterwards to develop myelodysplastic syndromes of a variety of different types. And sometimes these chromosomal changes and mutations can be quite high risk. And people just like, and you've seen these graphs before, I've shown them, uh, just like with MDS and AML can develop mutations. So um, these are three different um, uh, academic uh, teams at the NIH and Cleveland Clinic, as well as from Japan, who looked at their p population of patients with aplastic anemia and found a series of mutations within them, and specially found mutations that also define certain types of MDS. Okay, so aplastic anemia can in many ways also uh, be defined by certain uh, mutations, especially as uh, there is evolution in some cases towards myelodysplastic syndromes. And with that, I'd like to um, end this presentation and uh, take any potential uh, questions which may arise from the audience. Thank you for your attention.
Thank you so much, Dr. Fathi, for your very wonderful presentation. Uh, we just got a few questions um, to address. Um, our first question comes from Chris. And Chris would like to know, can overexposure to radiation during an X-ray cause, uh, cause the mutations that lead to MDS? So uh, all of us um, in our normal routines and normal parts of life and normal diagnostic testing can be exposed to uh, radiation of a variety of different sorts. The radiation we get from, get from X-rays is at a significantly a lower burden than what we would get, for example, for radiation therapy for a malignancy. Even in patients who get radiation therapy for malignancy, the likelihood of developing subsequent secondary MDS or AML is extremely low but it is much higher than the patient who does not. So I would say that compared to the radiation that you receive for treatment of something or radiation from an environmental exposure, the radiation you get from imaging modalities are generally speaking lower significantly. All right, thank you. Uh, our next question comes from Lee, and Lee would like to know, when is it recommended for family members to be tested for genetic abnormalities if another immediate family member is diagnosed with MDS? I think that if, you know, uh, suffice it to say that all major academic centers have uh, genetic counselors who um, evaluate families and do actual analysis, close analysis, developing family trees, and doing testing to see if there is familial uh, concern. If you have a, an immediate family member, a sibling, a parent with the same disease, I think it's wise to at least speak to a genetic counselor to have some initial um, uh, interview and potential testing um, for uh, a familial syndrome. Familial syndromes of MDS and AML, at least the ones that are known, are very uncommon. All right, thank you. Uh, our next question comes from Donald, and Donald would like to know, how often should an MDS patient be tested for genetic abnormalities? Well, I, you know, it depends where you're being evaluated. In my patients, every time I assess uh, for progression of disease, I assess for mutational changes or chromosomal changes. So certainly at diagnosis, but if at any point during the course of treatment, if there is concern for disease progression or a relapse of disease, I think it is wise to look because new mutations can arise and potentially um, these alterations may impact your prognosis or in some cases may have therapeutic uh, implications. All right, thank you. Uh, our next question comes from Chris, and I believe Chris's question is similar to um, the first question that you uh, that I had read out about um, environmental factors and and things like that that you mentioned. But he um, is saying in MDS, are there any correlations between mutation and cause, like environment or radiation? Potentially. So if you've been exposed to um, radiation or certain types of chemotherapy for another disease or you're from an environment that in which you were exposed to actual um, uh, mutation in the environment, such as from, a, I don't know, from a, a factory, from a solvent, from an app, you know, those in theory can impact uh, the normal uh, healthy uh, processing of uh, genes and uh, chromosomes, you can develop mutations that, that in theory could fall within areas that may develop, uh, that may lend to a malignant uh, transformation of your myeloid cells. It, that in theory can happen. And the largest population of patients that we see are those individuals who have been previously exposed to radiation or chemotherapy for other cancers. And again, like I said, the likelihood of that even happening in that population is very, very low but higher than the, the normal population. Um, environmental triggers or alterations or mutations are more controversial. To sort of pin something or an AML or an MDS to an environmental trigger is very challenging and elusive because we don't know necessarily the dose of the exposure, uh, but we have some historical data to back that up, certainly from the nuclear bombings in Japan, uh, exposures in the past and certain um, occupational um, environments, uh, but uh, most of our patients, again, are those individuals who received certain types of chemotherapy and radiation for other malignancies. All right, thank you. Uh, our next question comes from John, and John would like to know, how can a mutation go away over time? <laughs> 
Well, a mutation can go away over time with treatment uh, if the treatment basically gets rid of um, the cellular clone that had that mutation. Um, a, a mutation can go over, away over time with cure of disease if, for example, patients uh, receive curative treatment in the case of AML with chemotherapy and transplant or chemotherapy alone or in the case of MDS with transplant. So um, when you get rid of the cells, the malignant cells that have the mutation, you're going to get rid of that mutation. Now, just because you can't detect the mutation doesn't mean it's gone, right? So we all have a lower uh, level, lower bar of detecting alterations. Um, so if we can't detect it, doesn't mean that it's not necessarily there. It's just below the lower detection level of detection, and that may mean that it's not there, but does not necessarily mean that is the case. But most of the time, mutations can go away. Um, sometimes they come back, but if they go away and stay away, um, and the patient is cured, that's usually as a result of treatment. All right. Thank you. Uh, our next question comes from Jim, and Jim has MDS with the IDH1 and the 2RSF2 mutations. Um, he was diagnosed in 2015 and is 64, and he would like to know, with these mutations, is it likely that he will develop more mutations over time and progress to AML? So I'd rather not speak about individual cases, obviously, given the platform of what we're talking about today. Um, but uh, these mutations are common alterations seen with um, MDS, um, and um, there are, you know, potential avenues for treatment, especially when it comes to the IDH1 mutation. Just because one has these alterations does not necessarily mean they're going to do poorly, but I, again, or, or necessarily well, I think they need to, a lot of, there's lots of factors here, right? So I think a patient needs to be adequately worked up and evaluated by a specialist in marrow malignancies, look at a variety of uh, factors, including age, demographics, prior history, current status, functional status, as well as the mutations to come up with a better understanding of prognosis. So just looking at these mutations, I cannot say whether a patient will do better or worse. All right. Well, I believe those are all the questions that we have today. Thank you so much, Dr. Fathi, for your wonderful presentation and for your time. I would also just like to add that if you would like to rewatch this webinar at a later time, please be on the lookout for an email that will provide you with an archive link within four to seven business days. On behalf of the Aplastic Anemia and MDS International Foundation, I would like to thank each and every one of you for joining us today, making us your resource of choice for information on bone marrow failure diseases. If we were not able to answer your question today, please send it to us via email at help, that's H-E-L-P, at A-A-M-D-S dot org so that our patient educator can respond, or visit our online academy at A-A-M-D-S dot org forward slash learn for interviews with experts and other programs that may address your question. As a reminder, as soon as I'm done speaking, a post-event survey will appear requesting your feedback. We appreciate your, your time to complete this survey. Again, thank you for joining us, and remember, learning is hope. This concludes today's program.